Hello and welcome to UAT time within the United Countries special by First Ukraine. You can find us on the frequencies available on our website firstua.com. I'm Sergei Velichansky. And I am Olivier Vedrin. UAT time is dedicated to bring Ukraine and Europe closer to each other by introducing the real Ukraine to the rest of the world. As a Greek billionaire, Aristotle Onassis once said, the secret of business is to know something that nobody else knows. And I want to add from myself, especially if you do business in Ukraine. These days, Ukraine celebrates 24th anniversary of independence, and there are good people that have committed their life to enjoy Ukraine since the very beginning and still are doing that. Our guest today is Thierry Picard a former member of the board of the European Business Association and a former member of the Committee of Foreign Investment to Kiev. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for a cup of tea. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned right prior to the program, you mentioned that this year has been quite a good year for you. Yeah. Well, in spite of all the things that are happening in Ukraine, my question is, what is it that you do? I'm one of the leading real estate agents in Ukraine. I'm certainly the oldest Western Ukraine, Western um, foreign in property investment and real estate company in Ukraine. We've been here for operating since September 1992. Wow. That's, that's, that's wow. almost a long time. That's uh, almost the years of independence. Yeah. Um, well, we want to go back a little bit to get to know you uh, better. You arrived to Ukraine in 1982. That was pretty much a chaos. Yeah. But that was probably a golden time for real estate, in a sense, especially with the currency exchange. Actually, it was, because at the time when I came here, and that's the reason I did come here, there were virtually no Western-style offices in Ukraine. So when I started to develop buying up old apartments in the center of Kiev, and converting them to Western-style offices, business was good. Uh, in in uh, some of the information I read about you, that even uh, you you knew, did you know Margaret Thatcher personally? Well, after the trip here with her, yes. Yes, that's was it like 1990? Yeah, 1990. It was a British business delegation trip to Ukraine. So we, it was a whole group of us, I think about 30, 40 people. We oh. flew into Ukraine together with Margaret Thatcher. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Iron Lady. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's what we hear, but uh, knowing her personally, or at least in person, uh, do you think she's that Iron Lady? She was... Uh... My personal opinion, and some hate her and others admire her, um, but I think she probably saved the British economy. Totally agree with this point of view. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the European country, the first country who did some reforms was Great Britain mm -hmm. and was with Margaret Thatcher. And, uh, and after that, Schroeder did some uh, reforms in Germany. And now France tried to do some reform, but yes. the first country was Great Britain. Really, and that sure, yes, saved Great Britain. Saved the Great Britain. I economy. think she did. I yeah. really do think she did. Yeah, totally agree with this point of view. Well, you know, uh, as from Ukrainian standpoint, I just hope that we will have somebody who is uh, willful enough to bring reforms to Ukrainian uh, politics and economy. And um, you were here that long, and you had. First of all, you've uh, worked and lived here through all of our uh, presidents. Yeah. And um, maybe I can ask you a tricky question. Under what president was it easier to work? I don't, I don't think really there's been, for me, there's been that much difference. Um, I can say which one was the most difficult. Okay. And that was Yanukovych. Okay. Um, because the level of corruption that was hitting the country, I mean, every, everything you did, there were backhanders going on, and it was really was wiping out the economy. And you think for, for you, Yanukovych is the best corrupt president of Ukraine? Sorry? It's the best corrupt president of Ukraine? Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It, it was absolute total thug. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, you, he's rumored to have collected $30 billion together. Wow. Well, I mean, everybody, every aspect of life was paying money into his golden pot. 
And you, 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 you see now some difference, yeah? Yeah, significantly. Significant, yeah. yeah. We don't have the uh, tax collectors come around every five minutes mm -hmm. trying to find some excuse to draw some more money out of us. Um, the police are a lot more friendly on the streets of Kiev, so you don't yeah. get stopped every five minutes for some minor violation and have to pump out money. So that's, it's, it's a huge difference. And uh, you see there's some result in foreign investment? Not yet. Not yet. No. Mm. Um, my, my company is actually, we have three divisions that we operate in. One is the residential, mm -hmm. uh, which is doing mostly 90% of our businesses to diplomats. Mm -hmm. And that's the growing sector of the real estate market because private businesses are tending to leave mm -hmm. or at least their Westerners are leaving and they're putting more Ukrainians in charge. But the embassies and the NGO companies, the European Bank, the World Bank, mm -hmm. uh, all these are expanding. Mm -hmm. So there's more of them coming in. So that's a busy sector. Mm -hmm. And the other part, the first area which I think you'll have significant um, foreign investment coming into Ukraine will be agriculture. I am totally agree. That's the history of Ukraine. You know, it's a very, very powerful country in agricultural sector. And could be more. massively more. It, I mean, the, depending which economists you talk to, the the growth in agriculture could be four to sixfold. But what about the law to to buy some uh, private farms or that? This is not well, very easy to buy. The moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's just totally ridiculous. And as, the, the, as far as I, I believe, the main reason for that is the old oligarchs mm -hmm. were leasing it all up into great big clumps mm -hmm. so that when the day came that they'd cancelled the moratorium, they'd buy it all cheap. And is it very easy to buy a little piece of Ukrainian help? <laughs> well, it's, it's, not, it's not easy. What, what you, you can buy are what's called agricultural holdings. Mm -hmm. And these holdings can be from uh, 500 hectares to 300,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. And what the people there have done, they've actually leased mm -hmm. all of this land. Mm -hmm. And then they, send, they sell the company that has the leases. Mm -hmm. So you still can't. But the problem with that is that banks don't like to finance mm -hmm. short-term leased land because mm -hmm. yeah. there's no collateral. Yeah, to tell you. And the agriculture, the desperate need in Ukraine is money investment. Mm -hmm. So I've written an, art, an article which got published in Business Ukraine not long ago. And I said, Ukraine should not have a, a, a financial problem. You've got 33 million hectares of the best soil in the world. If you, even if you valued it at $1,000, which is one-fifth of the price of land in, mm -hmm. in Poland, mm -hmm. that's $33 billion. Mm -hmm. And for every $1,000 you buy land for, you'd have to put an equal amount in to produce it, to make it more productive. Mm -hmm. So that's another 33 billion, which could easily come into Ukraine. So yeah. that's 66 billion. Mm -hmm. yes. That solves Ukraine's uh, financial problems like that. Easier, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that uh, sounds uh, perspective, uh, but uh, we know what's happening in uh, Donbass right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, first of all, uh, since we talk about the business and your business as well, were, was your business um, uh, in any way, uh, uh, you know, uh, harmed in Donbass or Crimea? Were you uh, involved in, in any some of, in any projects there? One of our one of our uh, major clients has property all over Ukraine. They've got 40 units, and some of their property was actually in the Donbass area, okay. and they had some in Crimea. Um, we were property advisors to this group, so they lost about I think eight properties in Crimea and Donbass altogether. Um, but that's the only client that we had. Most of our other clients are either in Odessa, okay. mm -hmm. um, which is now with Mr. Sakashvili, it looks as though it could be going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the other one is in Lviv, mm -hmm. where we've got two major projects. One of them, them we're working with the, the European Bank of Reconstruction mm -hmm. Development. Mm -hmm. And we're probably going to be managing one of their assets in Lviv. Wow. Well, I have always wanted to uh, ask this question. Uh, I since hope you I can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure you do. Uh, but at least, you know, a no is an answer as well. But uh, um, since you are the consultant to a client 
who had lost property in Crimea due to annexation of Crimea. Could there be law pursuit? Could there be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an attempt to submit documents to the international court? There could be, but whether, whether any decision made by the European court would be any way upheld by the Russian authorities, yeah. I think is highly doubtful because they don't seem to be taking any notice of any. Do you know the other day I saw that they'd actually, somebody had given 30 ducklings to somebody in Russia and they burnt them all? Yeah. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Yeah, uh, yeah, but th this is really a problem. You know, I mean, totally agree. Even if you, do, you go to court in Europe, they will not recognize the, the result of, uh, of the court of the European court. They don't take care. That's why investment in Russia is impossible now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, just they like with Yukas, international law, but do just you like yes, that? I know. But just like with Yukas, they start arresting their property and assets in Europe. That's the way to go. Isn't that the way? Yeah, but you, we, 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 can, we can block all the assets of Yukos in Yukos, in this Yukos affair, but uh, in, in Russia, what we will do? In no, Crimea, no. In what Russia, we will do? No, but Russia has a lot of assets and property all over the world. And so? And so, you know, if, if there are court decisions, uh, you know, uh, in favor of uh, third party, then... Uh, the uh, arrest. Uh, uh, okay, but that cannot solve the problem of investment in Russia no, or in no, no. Crimea. Well, but our, our program, pro UAT time is not about the yeah. investment in mm. Russia. Mm. So I, th I, think, I think at best it would be a long shot. Long shot, yes. Yeah. Very long shot. <laughs> yes, but, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is somebody loses uh, property and assets in Crimea due to illegal actions of uh, another country. Well, who country? says they are legal? I mean, the, some, 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 I've got two people in my office working uh, whose parents are still in Crimea, and they say that property has been taken away from people legally. Legally? Yeah. They just pass the relevant laws that's necessary yeah. or sign the document that's necessary, and you've lost it. Yeah. This is the Russian and attitude now. It's yeah. legal. Yeah, it's Apparently. legal. Okay, the point of view of the Russian, this is okay. legal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge challenge right now to international law. Well, it used to happen here under Yanukovych as yes, well, so it's not yes. new. It's well, not new. The, no. the, that's, that's where Yanukovych learned it from. Well, probably. He took some classes in Moscow. Well, probably, think. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, ah, oh boy. Um, do you see the difference between uh, Orange Revolution and Euromaidan? And what, what uh, your uh, feel? I actually, in the 2004, we were very, very active, and we ha actually had um, Mr. Yushchenko's party office in my office downstairs. Mm. Oh. He was renting his office of me. Okay. So we were very much in the middle of the revolution that was going on. And my young staff in the office were very excited and agitated, and their eyes were full of optimism and, and so forth, and we were giving out soup and coffee and everything that was to the people there. The biggest disappointment came from that is the fact that nothing happened. Yeah. I mean, I think um, um, Yushchenko really let the country down. Everyone was so excited that Ukraine was finally to become more European, and it just died away. This time, I think the people are now more activated, and I don't think there's any way we can go back to the way things were. Yeah, the I people are now I, I, aware of their own strength, their own abilities, and they will not let that happen. Uh, I think in the history of Ukraine, we can say that uh, we have a period before Maidan and after Maidan, because uh, really now the civil society is growing up. Yes. And that's, that's a really the key point and big change yeah. for Ukraine. Absolutely. And with the first, uh, the Orange Revolution, that was not the case. No, not the case. Not, nothing changed no. very much. There's a no. lot of enthusiasm, uh, a lot of young people very excited that the change was really going to come. But then between Timoshenko and Yushchenko, the whole thing fell yeah. apart. That's um, why we can be optimistic, because, you know, the civil society is here, and the civil society with the NGO will force the Ukrainian government to do the reforms. Yeah. And before, that was impossible. Yeah, they, I think they will. I, yeah. don't, I don't think there's any way of going back. You yeah. know, it, it took us 10 years from the Orange Revolution to Euromaidan, uh, 10 years of stagnation, pretty much, of uh, regaining of trust that uh, changes could take place. Mm -hmm. Because after the disappointment, 
of the or Orange Revolution. No one wanted to do anything. That was the ideal setting and foundation for uh, guys like Yanukovych. Yeah. Because no one believes in future or you know patriotism or uh, uh, selfishness. I mean, what one story I can tell you that um, in in the previous revolution, my Ukrainian wife, um, if you sang, sang the na national anthem, she really wasn't that interested. There was no great Ukrainian feeling or enthusiasm about it. When they sing the national anthem now. She almost stands up like I do when they sing God Tame the Queen. They've, the whole of the, my Ukrainian family have become passionately Ukrainian. That's the yeah. result of being yeah. done. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, National identity. Yeah, exactly. By yeah. the way, let me correct myself. I said uh, nobody believed in selfishness, but that's what was all over the place. No one believed in selflessness. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. So. I'm no, just... it's a huge change, and I, I yes, think it's, yes. it's wonderful, exciting. This year, this year is going to be very tough economically, mm -hmm. and possibly most of next year as well. well. In economy, what do you think? You think we can have an exam? We can have the same way, like in Poland, uh, uh, Ukraine would be more and more economically strong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, according to, I mean, if you read some of the positive economists, mm -hmm. I have read from more, from more than one. That said, in the next decade, next decade, then yeah. during the next decade, Ukraine could be the most exciting economy in Europe. You've got, you've got oil and gas, yeah. So you could be energy independent. Mm -hmm. You've got an agricultural industry which could grow four to six times mm -hmm. in that period. You've got a wonderfully educated youth, very well educated. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, very capable. Uh, and then also you've got the forestry industry, which mm -hmm. has got other huge potential. So, I mean, this, the principal elements of a booming economy, this could be the best economy in Europe. And if you look at the rest of Europe, they're struggling, they get excited, they get 0.5% growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ukraine for a while even had 6 or 7%, and we could go back to those days, and it could last a decade. Well, one decade. But what comes after that, I don't know. I'm not going to forecast. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but for 10 years, 10 years, this could be the most exciting country in Europe. Mm. Yes, it's a good uh, longer perspective. But uh, pretty much uh, within the next uh, two months, we have another challenge coming up. It's elections, local elections. And we're not talking about local elections all over uh, Ukraine, but we're talking about possible elections in uh, Donbass if they ever take place. Because with the recent uh, shelling again, mm -hmm. uh, I kind of really doubt that it's going to take yeah. place. But uh, what, what um, you know, any ideas on uh, elections uh, or anybody you know who's uh, running uh, for some offices? Well, um, my, my previous managing director now is now moved out to Moscow. He's trying to come back and get elected onto the Kiev Council. So, well, I'll, I don't know whether it'll happen or not, but I'm really not involved in local elections okay. in Ukraine. Sure. I don't know very much about them. Sure. Um, I just hope that people don't give up too quickly. Yeah. But I think even if we have bad results, that cannot change the way. I don't think so. I think the overwhelming majority want to see us pushing yeah. towards the European yeah. model and openness and, and the getting, the way that we start getting rid of all this corruption mm -hmm. and everything else. It's not going to be easy. No. I mean, there's going to be some people in various positions within politics and regions and regional governors who are going to fight like crazy. Mm -hmm. They want to hold on to their golden cup. And it's going to have to be very difficult to take it away from. But the people, I mean, you read in the papers now, more and more local people, journalists coming up, and are now daring mm -hmm. to fight yeah. and expose these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that trend is going to continue. No, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Um, well, we, we have a lot more questions, but the time is uh, running real fast. Um, what do you think about the sanctions that uh, Europe and, uh, well, the West is placing right now not enough over Russia okay yeah uh, I mean, my opinion the, the Russian people are supposedly apparently the majority of them are supporting Putin yes. so if they're going to support Putin I think we should stop giving them visas to come to Europe 
and maybe the people realize then but he's turning Russia into a North Korea yes he, he, yes but I think we can maybe give visa for the Russian people to come in Europe to see difference well they will, but they don't see the difference they just come on holiday and spend all their ill-gotten money mm. well the question is yes uh, how, how well, many all Russians the, all are the, traveling? How many of the leaders in Russia have got their kids in Western yes, schools exactly. uh, of course I know a lot of Russian they have, they have their kids in in uh, US University well, uh, French University to UK University they have their property assets all but over the world but only the small elite well, yes but how many just regular Russians do travel mm. No. Part of the middle class, but uh, not a large part. That, that's the thing, and uh, and so yes, they travel. But I agree with you. We have to do more sanction, and for for example, the SWIFT system. Why we didn't block? Yeah, I think that's one of the first things we should. do. I think this is the next one. Yeah, boom. So, and in uh, and in two or three days, we can we can make very very big damage for the mm -hmm. Russian economy. Well, it, if it, we, it's, if I we mean, stop the it is, system. It is going downhill, and apparently Saudi Arabia has said categorically they're going to increase their oil production mm -hmm. because the oil costs them $8 to take out of the yeah. ground. If they sell it at 50, they're still making enough money. Yes. At that level, Russia's got major problems. Mm -hmm. And the demand for oil is going down, the production is going up. Mm -hmm. But if Putin wants to sit there and say, we will have our own mozzarella cheese, we don't need Italian. Fine, you carry on. You eat Russian mozzarella. No, but that's will not, that cannot that's, that cannot survive in our in our world. Well, I just hope it happens as soon as possible because yes. he is the pariah of Europe at the moment. When I was on Maidan, you know, with my friend, we really understood very quickly that it was not against Yanukovych. Yeah. We don't. We didn't fight against Yanukovych. We fought against Putin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yanukovych was only a muppet. Yes, he was. And I, I'm sure that tomorrow, the one year, two years, we will be, this spirit of Maidan will be in, in, in Moscow. The civil society, uh, the spirit of the civil society will be in Moscow. I am I, sure of that. I, really. I hope so. I'm not quite as optimistic as you, but one would hope so, is there are enough Russians. But the Ukrainians and Russians are different. I said it when I came here in 1992. The Ukrainians are more European. Yeah. They're more nicer in character. They're easier to do to live with and be with. And I, when I had an operation, when I first came out here in Moscow, Petersburg, and Kiev, mm -hmm. I got rid of the Moscow and Petersburg office and focused everything on Kiev because it's a much nicer place to be with people. And I've got a Ukrainian wife, which helps. <laughs> well, that helps. <laughs> but the difference, you know, we can see in the history, is, the difference is simple. In Ukraine, you have the Cossack attitude, Republic of the Cossack, Orlik constitutions, mm -hmm. and in Russia, you have authoritarianism with the Tsar. And it's yeah. two mentalities very different. Yes. I am agree with you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the final question would be, uh, how, can you, can, how can one become successful in business in Ukraine? Uh, tenacity and hard work, the same as anywhere else. Right. I mean, someone asked me, is, aren't the problems in Ukraine more difficult than anywhere else? And I've worked in, in many countries, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, Germany, Holland, UK. The, some of the problems are more often not the same. It's the mix that varies. But there's no country you can go to where business is easy. You still have to work damned hard. All right. And tenacity. Yeah. Well, Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, yes, enjoy a little bit uh, of our tea. <laughs> it was uh, Terry Picard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thomas Jefferson once said, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. It was United Country UA Tea Time by First Ukraine. Thanks for joining us for a cup of tea. Olivier Vedrin and Sergei Velichansky were working for you in the studio. Stay with us and we will show to you the Red Crane. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and see you soon.